And uh, Father Philip, as many of you know, has been a friend of mine for many years. And um, I'm delighted that he uh, uh, received the habit, as it were, as an archimandry recently uh, in uh, Balamand. And uh, saving his blushes, richly de deserved. And uh, it's wonderful that perhaps we may have in the future uh, some sort of monastic presence, who knows. Uh, um, we're already thinking, praying about that um, here in this country. Um, so, uh, the fourth lecture is about St. John of Damascus, the Damascene, as he's often referred to, who has the dignity, perhaps also with St. Maximus the Confessor, of being um, equally honoured by both the Christian East and the Christian West, uh, post-schism, that is, as well as before. Um, a, a hugely influential person in the Christian East, and of course, one of the loyal sons of Antioch, and quite an extraordinary life. And much to teach us about um, the witness of Christians uh, in today's society. So welcome, Father Philip, and we look forward to your lecture, and um, over to you. Thank you. I'll just have to switch the uh, tack on. Just a second. Welcome to this, the fourth lecture in our Archdiocesan Conference. Our commander, Philip Paul, now is going to address the topic of St. John of Damascus. I can either look at what I've written, or I can look at you. <laughs> I have to look at what I've written, but I prefer to look at you. <laughs> <coughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, God is one. Amen. 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 Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Through the prayers of our Holy Father, John, Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, have mercy upon us and save us. Amen. St. John was born in Damascus in about the year six, 765. I'm dyslexic, so if I see numbers, I'm very likely to read them the wrong way around. So that was a really good example. <laughs> so, yeah, six, five in Damascus. He was born into a rich culture and an ancient city. There's very good evidence about Damascus that it has been continually inhabited for 8,000 years, and quite possibly, though nobody knows, for rather longer than that, possibly even another 2,000 years beyond that. There are certainly settlements for a good 2,000 years before then in that region. The area is semi-arid, so it doesn't get much rain, although I discover that in Lincolnshire we get less rain than they do in Damascus. <laughs> in ancient times, there was a small river that went through it, there still is, but back then it was enough to supply people with water for all the things that people need. But its real distinction is that it's on a crossroads of the trade route, with Egypt in the south, Asia Minor in the north, the fertile area of the Euphrates in the east, and of course, fertile Lebanon in the west. Thus, it was a place of commerce, a place of mixing of cultures and peoples, and as a result of this, it became a place of learning and wealth. Interestingly, you can read about Damascus in the book of Genesis where Abraham goes up there and, according to some legends, Abraham actually made Damascus his home. Such places attract the eyes of greedy people. Unsurprisingly, Damascus came to the attention 
of a variety of pharaohs, such as Tutmos III and Ramesses II. Also, of course, you will know that Alexander the Great, or as I grew up knowing him in Afghanistan, Alexander the Demon, <laughs> conquered also Damascus and on the way down into Egypt, and then of course, of course, to Sogdiana and as far as India. So, immediately after Alexander conquered it, you will know that his successors quarreled about the place, and it became a place of disruption as well. However, it remained a very important trading post, and by the end of the first century BC, it began to, to gain prominence as a bigger city under the relative peace of the Roman occupation. By the time of St. John's birth, 700 years later, it was still largely a Christian city and an exceedingly prosperous place. We'll go on. At the time of St. John's birth, it had already been taken over by the Muslims. The first direct contact with Islam was in a letter which their prophet wrote. Peace be upon him who follows true guidance. Be informed that my religion shall prevail everywhere. You should accept Islam. Whatever under your command will remain yours. By then Damascus was a large and prosperous place and they didn't feel the need to respond positively. Clearly, however, the Arab invasions from the south <coughs> brought uncertainty and fear. The surrounding countryside and the small villages fell one by one to the invaders who also settled themselves in favorable spots one way or another, bringing different sorts of pressures on the Levantine people who are there already. Father Gregory is not going to like the fact that I'm going to do the oddest side from what I've written. But that reminds me, uh, one of my colleagues, who's, a, um, who's an imam, as so I work in a very multicultural setting, said to me a little while ago, I said to him three years ago, about our bishops who have been kidnapped. I said, remember to get your people to pray for them as well. He said, there's a bishop there? He said, yes. He said, well, what's he doing there? When did, when did his family arrive? He said, I think you've got some history to learn. <laughs> but no idea at all that actually Islam came after Christianity and came with a different series of people as well. Muhammad died and was seated, um, succeeded by Abu Bakr who set about conquering yet more territory. He was particularly interested in the wealthy and politically strategically important city of Damascus. By 635, his troops surrounded and conquered Damascus, entering through the Eastern Gate, the city having been betrayed by a Coptic priest who then became a Muslim. Amongst those who surrendered the city to the generals was St. John's grandfather, who was an administrator in the city. <coughs> there we are. <coughs> this work then passed on grandfather to his son, St. John's father, Sergius Mansour, who was thus a wealthy man. When the saint was growing up in this wealthy household, <coughs> his father adopted another boy, Cosmas, and these two became inseparable, even working together on various projects for the whole of the rest of their lives. Another character enters the picture. By the way, have you seen the way I adopted this picture? <laughs> this man was taken as a slave and brought to Damascus for sale. He was a monk, also called Cosmas, and was from Sicily. He was redeemed by Sergius and set to work educating the two young men. He must have had a profound effect on them, 
as both of these two young men are now honoured as saints. St. John was taught, therefore, from a Western as well as an Eastern point of view. He was taught from Muslim sources as well. He followed a very broad curriculum that lasted a long time. He studied law, theology, philosophy, music, astronomy, arithmetic, and geometry. In his later works, St. John clearly makes use of this diverse learning and so is able to refute some of the claims of the Quran by having studied it. And also, in his later works, he produces beautiful works of great poetic, theological, and musical brilliance, but they're still sung in our churches to this date. It's thought that St. John followed in his father's footsteps. There is absolutely no proof of this, that he worked for the Caliphate itself. It would seem strange, though, if such a person of such evident intelligence and learning should not have come to the attention of the authorities. Also, back then, these sorts of jobs usually were inherited. However that might be, by the time he was 31, in the year 706, St. John made off for the monastery of Mar Saba in the Kidron Valley. You can see a picture of it just there. St. Saba, who died in 532, had lived an illustrious and difficult life moving several times in search of ever greater seclusion, but with a problem that monks would come and join him, and then they'd quarrel with him about how he ran his monastery, so he'd move deeper and deeper into the desert. We've heard of this several times with monks and finding seclusion. Um, Saint Saba also fought against the monophysites and also against the followers of Oregon. Interestingly, he took his arguments directly to the emperors. So little wonder that later his disciple John felt the ability to do the same. The monastery itself was founded in 484, so by the time John arrived, it was already 222 years old. That's a number I can read. <laughs> and thus well settled. The monastery appears to teeter on the cliff overlooking the Kidron Valley. Some, now, some miles southeast of Jerusalem, in a place that even now appears to be both bleak and lonely. There's one road leading to it, and the same one you take away. Here he remained, living quietly as a monk, until he was about 55 years old. This, to me, is a very important point. We have a tendency to take note of notable facts and notable dates about somebody, and think about the things they did. But we then forget what led up to these <coughs> notable dates and notable facts. Here, we are forced to recognize a significant 24-year silence, during which the saint devoted himself to the life of a monk. Having been at the centre of so much, in such an important place, he had the courage and the determination to take himself off to that desert and there grapple with the demons and overcome them. Back then, the monastery didn't look like that, of course. It was a series of caves and little huts. Grapple with those demons, overcome them, and find down his learning and his experiences so that they became useful to the Lord. Such patience. The first time I went to Lebanon, Father Christos, Archimandre Christos, said to me, he had three words for me. The first one he chucked me, he said, patience. <laughs> Without patience you can do nothing. Patience. Without patience you can do nothing. Patience. Without patience, Father, you can do nothing. Very important.
24 years he spends finding down his patience. <clears throat> and then the time to act came. Some background to set us in the mood. This isn't anything like as wonderful <clears throat> statue as you saw earlier on. A grim looking fellow. This one here is the Emperor Leo III. He came to the Byzantine throne in a typically Byzantine way. And as soon as he did so, he was required to beat off the Arab Muslim invaders who were threatening Constantinople. He succeeded, and that great city was saved for the moment. He rebuilt the army, reformed taxation, settled remote areas with fierce Slavs, who protected the core from further Arab and Muslim invasions. He freed the serfs. He remodeled various laws, including the death penalty, and he remodeled that to be mutilation or imprisonment in most cases. In many ways, this emperor appears to be, in the words of 1066 and all that, a good thing. <laughs> However, at about this time, those who opposed the use of icons were also coming to the fore. And like so many things, this person, Leo III, was not an undiluted blessing. The basic arguments against icons, I'm sure you know. One, that lifeless images should not be made to <coughs> represent either the Lord or his saints. And I'm sure if you went down this hill of the way, you'll find about a hundred people who will agree with that statement. <laughs> Secondly, a real image should be an exact likeness of the original. And therefore, the icon breakers, the iconoclasts, would say that only the Eucharistic bread and the wine would do. Down the hill, they wouldn't agree with that. Next, they said that a true icon of Christ would have to represent his humanity, and also his divinity, but they said, making images either separated the natures or confused them, and therefore led believers into two different heresies, the heresy of the Nestorians and the heresy of the Monophysites. They also asserted that icons were a carryover from paganism, and also that they had been banned in the Old Testament. And then, of course, there are those who say that their <coughs> real agenda was playing up to the Muslims on their borders who taught something very similar. In 726, the iconoclast Emperor III issued his first edict against the veneration and public display of icons. At this point, St. John of Damascus reached for his basil and bond, and he wrote to the emperor. He put pen to paper with some force. This writing, though, was written in an extremely simple and engaging and beautiful way that even in a clumsy modern English translation makes for good and easy reading. And you'll be glad to know, you don't have to pay anybody to read it, you can download it easily from the internet. <coughs> St. John acted. St. John's principal argument is that he did not worship matter, but the creator of matter. Also, he made an important distinction between worship and veneration. He worshipped the creator, but he venerated the matter through which, he said, salvation came to me, as if filled with divine energy and grace. Thus one could venerate the pages and the ink of the gospel, and the paint of the icons, and the wood of the cross, and the Eucharist. He made other salient points. Firstly, the Old Testament prohibition of images was, of course, superseded by the incarnation of Christ, the image himself. Also, God himself commanded the carving of images to go into the Holy of Holies itself. Therefore, 
over the top of the Ark of the Covenant were two huge cherubim. And if you read the description of the inside of the temple, you'll find all sorts of other carvings of trees and animals and pomegranates and other things like that. But he then said there's a big difference between pagan idols and Christian icons. And this, I think, is really important. Idols depict something that is entirely imaginary, whilst icons depict reality. Are icons of real people, a real God, whereas a, a statue of Jupiter or Ceres is of a fake God, one that doesn't exist. He stated as well that icons had been used throughout the tradition. At the time, he had no real proof of that, but with archaeology, we can see that is true. I'm coming very close to proving that case. And then, of course, he said that some icons were made by God himself, like the Mandelion. And therefore, by doing so, God was blessing icons and the making of new ones. And of course, we know that St. Luke wrote icons to the Mother of God. Finally, he said, the emperor had no right to ban icons. Only a council of the church could do this. When I wrote the next little bit, I actually thought of Chad. I would like to say that Leo III threw himself, hurled himself on the floor, gnashing and grinding his teeth, weeping and heaping ashes on his head, tearing at his hair, and throwing his clothes on the floor and swapping them for sackcloth. But unfortunately, that's not what happened. Instead, he made up stories about St. John. He forged letters because, of course, St. John had written letters, so his handwriting could be copied. His style could be copied. And he forged these letters and statements saying that St. John was plotting against the Caliphate. And he gave these letters to the Muslim Caliph, who lost no time cutting off the saint's right hand and hanging it up as a warning for others. Eventually, the Caliph allowed St. John to take possession of his hand, and in much pain, he prayed before the icon of the Mother of God, Theodokos, who in a miracle restored the hand to his arm and to health. And you may have noticed icons of the Theodokos with three hands. This commemorates that miracle. The third hand is an image of St. John's hand, which he placed there as a thanksgiving for his healing. It's made of silver. You can see it in this icon here. It always puzzles people when they see it for the first time. Now, going on with patience, you might be interested to know that despite his writings, and despite his hand being healed, despite his turning to the Mother of God, it was a further 61 years before iconoclasm at that time came to an end, not until the Second Council of Nicaea in 787 that his words prevailed and the icons were restored. In fact, his writings were extremely important in that and were used as the basic text by the fathers to show that they were not just nice, but they are necessary. St. John wrote many other works as well, which show the width, width and the depth of his learning and his intelligence. One on logic in which he instructs his readers so that they may understand the rest of his points. So he's a good teacher. Says, you're not going to understand this, so I'll teach you this first. Then, one against heresy of all different types. It's merely a reworking of an earlier work by uh, Epiphanes. But he adds a chapter <coughs> on Islam from his own learning. In this, he doesn't hold any, anything back. Remember that he's surrounded by Muslims at the time. Very courageous what he does. He describes Muhammad as a false prophet and the Quran 
as a ridiculous set of compositions. He criticized Muhammad's assertion that the Jews only crucify the shadow of Christ, and thus Christ neither suffered nor died. He points out that Muhammad wrote the Lord did not claim to be God, and indeed made up a passage where Jesus denies that he is God. Also, St. John pointed out that Muhammad's mission is not prophesied in the scriptures, but that Muhammad acted as his own witness. St. John also criticized the sexual morality of Muhammad. I think we can fairly say that if we said any of these things publicly now and didn't attribute them to somebody else, they would quickly be visited by prevent. He would get into big trouble with the British government today. Then he also wrote on ecclesiology, the dogma of what is actually the church. He wrote about the Trisagion on him, and he wrote about the two wills of Christ. And then there is a perfectly delicious work on dragons and ghosts. If you've not read it, when you go home you don't do anything else, then look this up on the internet. It is wonderful. It's a wonderful composition. It is very easy to read, and it's delightful. In it, St. John uses the science that's available to him at the time to refute, <coughs> note, to refute superstitious ideas, and eventually says something I think ought to be written on many of our hearts, which is, ignorance is truly an unreliable thing. <laughs> I love that as an ex-teacher. It's a wonderful and beautiful thing to hear. But read it. It is superb. And he describes uh, the length of some serpents that have been discovered. When you read it, it sounds odd. My father in Kenya in 1945 also measured a serpent about the same length. It actually took two hours to cross a road. The serpent did a huge thing, probably extinct now, like so many other animals are. But back then in 1945, there were certainly <coughs> serpents, snakes that big, and that's what St. John was talking about as dragons. But he said, you know, they're not werewolves. I've not written any of this down. I'm being punished. <laughs> so, so dragons are not werewolves, they don't do all sorts of funny things, they don't change their shape, so they're a real thing. They, they, they measured them, it was this big. They took its skin and they took it off to Rome, and everybody was astonished by it. Then of course we also owe to St. John a daily debt, because of his work on the Octiochos. The Octiochos, the eight-week cycle of prayers and hymns. He took what was already there and he developed it. Actually, the Roman Catholics particularly criticized his reworking of other people's work. And so he had hardly any ideas of his own. He just chose other people's things and made use of that. I think that's actually a great use of the tradition. He took what was there and he developed it alongside his adopted brother Cosmos. Possibly assigning the eight melodies in the matter that we know in the manner that we know them now. The resurrectional stichera in particular seem to be first composed by them. If we think of the huge amount of teaching material in the Orthodox Church, it is difficult to imagine where we would be nowadays without the Octuipos. It is absolutely filled with teaching material. And it's solid, drip, drip drip of teaching and worship every day in Matins and in Vestments and in Great Compline nourishes and strengthens our faith and in part at least we have St. John to thank for that. Then if you've been to a funeral recently or been in the choir at a funeral you'll remember the anthem in all eight tones composed by him. It is so direct and so real. On the one hand, making the fact and nature of death so clear, and not, as so often today, hiding death. 
and on the other hand, giving us hope in the resurrection from the dead, and not as today, having some pretense of granny disembodied, somehow rather nearby, so favoured by modern undertakers. <laughs> so that, you know, you can write notes to Granny on a little dove-shaped paper <laughs> and put it into the coffin. Or you can write nice things on the bunches of flowers and stuck around it, you know, Granny, I hope you're fine. She isn't. <laughs> Granny is dead. But it's that inability to face death properly that St. John helps us <coughs> listen to this. I'm going to read all of it. I'm just going to read one bit for the tone two part. Woe is me. What manner of ordeal doth the soul endure when from the body it is parted? It stretches out its hands to men and findeth none to succour. Wherefore, my brethren beloved, meditating on the brevity of life, let us beseech of Christ rest for him who hath departed hence, and for our soul's great mercy. See the two things put together there, in a beautiful way. If you want to think about death, which we should do, then go and read that part of the funeral service. It is very, very moving, and helps us to come to terms with the reality of our own death, and our hope in the resurrection. <clears throat> then our saint continued with this earthly pilgrimage on earth. He continued to write and to teach, and at the ripe old age of 60, he was ordained priest, but continued in his monastery until, in December 749, at about the age of 74, St. <coughs> John died and was buried in his monastery near to the relics of St. Sabbath. And that is his biography. Now, almost everything else I'm going to say has been said by one or other, the other clergy who's spoken, or by Satan. So although Father Gregory said that I wasn't made, meant to do anything great on this part here, I'm going to be slightly, but only slightly, disobedient. And just go through. So what? <coughs> What's this got to do with us? What can we learn from his life that's useful to this big archdiocese. Tiny numbers of people, but quite large geographically. St. John was very well educated in a variety of subjects. We need to honour and further education and learning of all kinds. Sayedna so has mentioned about making sure that theological education becomes something greater. We're not in a position yet to build a new Balamand, but maybe, actually, with university fees being what they are, Balamand becomes a very good option for some of our young people. And I will stake myself on it, that's a superb place to be. <coughs> really hard work, though. They make people work very hard. There's none of this sort of slacking around like you see in many of our universities. There it is. Wouldn't you like your sons and daughters to go there? St. John was a monk. We have no Antiochian mm. monastery for men or women in these islands. We cannot currently exercise a vocation to monasticism here. Imagine how a monastery, I'm not going to tell you how it will, imagine how a monastery could change the spiritual formation of us all. It, they, could be placed, a place, places of prayer, gathering, teaching, rest, hospitality, <coughs> training of new clergy, some are rather for people to recover, and so on. Saidna should recognize this place. St. John was intelligent and experienced. We should also be on the active lookout for men and women who have worldly and spiritual gifts and experience to bring to our archdiocese. These can then serve our parish and archdiocese and councils and structures, and work in all sorts of ways within our parishes. And you might be surprised to see who it is that we already have. 
St. John, of course, was a priest, quite an elderly priest. That's quite a lot of comfort for many of us. <laughs> it's obvious that we need more priests and deacons, and we need them soon. Our first crop of clergy tended to be entrepreneurial types, who were great at getting things going and having the vision and enormous resilience to do so. We need more like this, but we also need others who are great at developing what has been started and what's already there. Could either of these be you, your son, your brother, your husband? St. John lived in a time of great change and upheaval. The Muslim <coughs> invasions, sudden cultural upheaval, sudden ethnic diversity, religious disruption, loss of old certainties. You know, you don't have to be my age to know that's happened. You'd be quite young to suddenly see a huge change in this country. Is our archdiocese resilient to such change? Are we going to be bystanders whilst fearful we watch these changes, or will we be active in creating a better, more cohesive society? Are we going to be yeast and salt and light? And that shows how much we've changed. Very positive image, I think. St. John stood up to Rome, even though it meant flying in the face of the Emperor Leo III. For this, his hand was cut off. Do we have anything to say about poverty in these islands? About human rights of the oppressed, including those yet to be born, who may have been conceived? And, downtrodden, the duties we have to foreigners, the morality of some of our trade, producing a more Christian nation here. You know, there are some cartoons that show bombs being sold, and you see this horrible curve going round, ending up in Syria. <coughs> or are we timidly walking past? That's a shocking picture. In the fifth wealthiest economy. St. John preached the truth against wrongdoing and heresy. Do we have anything to say to our materialistic world, to people of other religions and other Christian denominations? We know the Lord accepts people as they are. He loves them as they are, but he loves them so much, he wishes for them to change. And it's that second part there we often forget to say. Do we <coughs> love others so much that we wish for all of them to be transformed in Christ? Or are we happy to let them just carry on as they are? Put in, put in war into Google and see what you get out. St. John used simple, easily understood language and a gripping style that helps ordinary people engage with complicated ideas. For this reason, he is also known as the Golden Speaker. I like that one. Is our preaching and our teaching, our websites, newsletters, magazines, videos, pamphlets of excellent quality? Can people engage with them? Can people find our teaching easily? Does it make sense to them? Do we have people who can teach us? how to make these things excellent. You know, if you ask people what they think about God in the street, if they're honest, most of them will say, I never think about God. And in fact, if you ask them to define, say something about <coughs> God, they'll be tongue-tied because they don't have any understanding of a word like that. There's no vocabulary there. So where, where do we begin? This is a good example, Be the Bee. I don't know if you come across it on the internet. It's really excellent. If you find it, I find it a little annoying. But I think it's not really directed at people like me. It's directed at much younger people than I am. But it's very clever and very good. There are lots of others. 
I had coffee with Sister Bassa, thinking ice cream with Archie Mandrake Philip. You need to know me well to know why that's good. And, and so, what I'd have during Lent, I don't know. No ice cream with Father <laughs> Sorbet. St. John was passionate about the reality of the Incarnation, that's why he was passionate about iconography. In our Archdiocese, are we also passionate about the Incarnation? As well as the iconography in our churches, homes, workplaces, are we incarnating the Gospel in these islands ourselves? I say, I say, are we saying to people, come and see? Huh? We're here. And that's what we often do, we say we're here, rather than saying, there you are. Let me come to you. Are we becoming actually a disincarnate group, enjoying being orthodox or ethnic or something else? Are we preaching to the choir, as the Americans say? That's just there because I thought it was nice. St. <laughs> John prayed before the icon of the Mother of God before his hand was restored. Are we ourselves finding and training and praying for iconographers to transform our iconography and bring, her, bring it home to these islands. You have got tens of thousands of saints here. There's plenty of work for people to do. Are we too easily accepting poor quality and thus disfiguring Christ, the Theodokos and his saints? Do our churches scream out about the Lord? <coughs> St. John was a noted spiritual director. Do we make proper use of spiritual direction? Again, something that Saidna and others have said already. How can those who hear confession and give advice to the faithful be helped to become themselves holy men? The Metropolitan keeps inviting us to read our Bibles. Time and again he says this, are we? Are we really reading them? Are we studying them carefully? Are we just reading them? St. John did not shy away from the reality of death. Truly, he says, most, most frightening is the mystery of death, how the soul is violently separated from its concord with the body, and by divine decree, the most natural bond of their cohesion is severed. <coughs> Do we become complicit in the no-death society in which we live? How are we reacting to the way undertakers and the death industry in this country is increasingly taking away all Christian content? and our ability to express the resurrection during funerals by undertakers telling us what to do rather than the other way around. In Lincoln, it's difficult to get any Christian to take a funeral now because the undertakers offer a complete service. You tell them exactly what you want, and they'll put it on. But they'll put it on from within the funeral home, exactly as it is. So you want prayers, you'll get prayers. You want humanist one, that's great, the same man will take that. Want to this one? and put on a dirty. What does that tell you about the funeral industry? <laughs> St. John emphasizes that he teaches and lives within the tradition, and something which I've already said Roman Catholics and Protestant writers criticize him for. If anyone preached to you something contrary to what the Holy Catholic Church has received from the Holy Apostles and Fathers and Councils, and has kept down to the present day, do not heed him. How much do we love the tradition that has been handed to us by Antioch and the rest of the church? Are we active in conforming ourselves to this tradition? I hope we will be becoming more and more active in doing that. Are we obedient to this tradition? How are we learning about it and from it? How can we develop this in our archdiocese? And finally, when the time comes, how are we going to tradition it to others? Hand it on to others. St. John loved the Theodokos and the other saints. Nor are the saints whom we glorify fictitious. This is about his work on iconography. They are in being and are living with God. And their spirits being holy, they help by the power of God those who deserve and need their assistance. Does our Christianity bring into everyday life the fullness of the communion of the saints of which the Theodokos is first? Some of us came from backgrounds in which this was new. 
What do we do to help converts and those from no previous religion to become natural orthodox? Not weird ones, but natural ones. It's very easy to be a weird orthodox, wear funny hats and strange clothes. That's not really nervous. As Aidan said earlier, it's about the Lord. Actually, orthodoxy is very simple. It's about the Lord. As you can see, very simple. <laughs> but all of that is about the Lord. All of it. St. John loved creation, so the whole earth is a living icon of the face of God. Um, I trained originally as an ecologist. It was really through the natural environment I began to come towards Christ. What are we doing to emphasize the holiness of God's creation? Not just in bare conservation, but in our priestly action within creation. That's everybody. Human beings, all the priests. Conservation is about keeping things as they are. That's not actually our job. We take part in creation. And you know, so often you see that a, a new national park or something is made, and the first thing they do is they remove all the people and stop anybody doing anything. Actually, that is not that is not what we're there for. Human beings are priestly. We take stuff and make other things with them. We find new meaning, new relevance, new ways to come to God through things. Our church garden is beautiful. Do our buildings and gardens protect, encourage, and give meaning to the creation? Are our buildings themselves priestly? <laughs> St. John developed and enriched the Octavicos. Is our worship beautiful? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Are our clergy, servers, chanters, and choirs trained? Is our worship resourced? Do we have adequate canons and akathists? And so on. Do we have the full Meneum? Do we have the full Octorikos? Is it in excellent English? No. 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 What about the basic services? <coughs> Do these reflect the heavenly worship? There's a lifetime of work to do for translators and poets. Two sitting over there, I'll probably get on with it. <laughs> really, a lifetime of work. <coughs> Is that worship beautiful? St. John of Damascus brings us Christ in his teaching, his life, and witness to the truth. And finally, and I'm not going to take questions because I'm not a PhD person. I'm, I'm a pre, you know, very ordinary parish priest from the back of beyond. Are we willing to come to the source of all truth and follow him? And that's what it's about in the end. Whatever the cost. The cost of your right hand or your throat. Ridicule in the streets. In Lincolnshire, I've had all sorts of things thrown at me at various times. Um, through the prayers of our Holy Father John, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy upon us and save us. Amen. Amen.